What's up, everyone? This is Franco from Hear Me Out Podcast. I have a very special guest here for you guys. It's uh, Dave Spuria. Others of you might know him as the Radical Independent. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, uh, Bruno, thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, what I like to ask people when they're on here for the first time is what motivated them to start their channel? So, Dave, what motivated you to start the Radical Independent YouTube channel? Uh, just real tired of um, stale perspectives out there, uh, whether they be on the left or the right. There's just a number of talking points that I continue to hear over and over again. And I felt that there's a good portion of the country that doesn't necessarily line up with either um, the Democrats or the Republicans. And whether you're, say, left of center, but in independent or right of center independent, I'm thinking that uh, there are a lot of people that need a home, they need a place where they can kind of relate. So that, that is why I started the channel, plus I was um, promoting Tulsi Gabbard's presidential campaign for quite some time, and uh, obviously uh, I am no longer doing that because Tulsi dropped out and endorsed Joe Biden. So I am now even more of a political refugee than I was before. Yeah, so you disagreed with that decision of hers, right? Yes, and I have taken uh, a real beating for um, just being honest. I was, it, look, I understand that she signed a pledge, uh, all the candidates did, and there's also a sore loser clause, which means that they cannot go off and um, run as a third party candidate. I'm not sure in the case, though, if it's a legal or binding type uh, agreement where they can sue you if you decide you want to go and run as a green or libertarian or something like, like that. So I my big issue with the way she went out, and you can watch the interview she did with Jimmy Dore, mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was sad. I mean, both Jimmy and Steph toward the end of it looked like they were going to cry because, I mean, this was just, she She started to talk like a, a uh, just a deflective politician. And yeah, they were very heartbroken. The Tulsi, yeah, <laughs> so that isn't the Tulsi that I got to know during the campaign, not literally know her, but just watching her. I know people that actually worked with her uh, up in New Hampshire. Uh, I know one diehard supporter, and she's just devastated. She's just quit. She's just out after what she went through. So anyway, uh, I've done a little bit of a pivot now. I, I've actually been talking about third parties and what might happen since probably last June or July. So uh, <laughs> it's just the natural progression of where I was going to go if this turned out like I thought it would. And unfortunately, it did. Yeah, now Bernie's out and a lot of us progressives or anti-establishment people are left in this gray zone where we don't know what to do. Some people are uh, going to write Bernie in, some people are going to write Tulsi in, um, other people are going to go third party like how you are going to do, um, other people are just going to stay home, and other people are just confused. They don't know what they're going to do, so we, I think we need to find... We all need to unify around one decision so that our voice can be more powerful and more heard. I think that the third party option is the best option we can do, but uh, there's still going to be some divide there. Some people are going to go libertarian or green party. So what do you think? What, why, why are you advocating for a third party vote? Well, um, I, I just don't know what else you can do. I, I, Here's the thing, uh, on two occasions now, the last two election cycles, uh, Bernie Sanders has tried to take over the Democratic Party. Uh, politicians like AOC got into the Democratic Party, and at the very beginning, they seemed to be progressive or independent and working class oriented and so forth. But then there's this assimilation that takes place where they begin to lose some of their identity and some of that, you know, that fire that they had when they first started mm. tends to wear off. 
Bernie this time around really was not an inspirational candidate uh, to me. I liked, obviously, much of his platform I thought was fantastic, but then things like free speech, the Julian Assange issue, he did not address yeah. at all, not one time. Uh, um, and the big one, the big elephant in the room was Russiagate, where he was actually using talking points from MSNBC and other places. And then what was ironic was during one of the debates, I think it was Michael Bloomberg who, who said that um, Bernie was a Russian agent. So that didn't do him any good at all. And Tulsi, kind of the same thing in a way, except that she was for free speech and she did uh, call out you know, uh, the media for ignoring Julian Assange and so forth. But then, you know, as I talked about at the very end, things just went exactly 180 degrees. So the reason I advocate for a third party is I'll use Jill Stein. Her quote to me uh, rings true. is like, you can't have a revolution in a counter-revolutionary party. Yeah. So it's basically if, if your vehicle, if your car and your driver, which is going to be Tom Perez in the DNC, they're going to take you to neoliberalville, whether you want to go there or not. You might be in the front seat of the car. You might have a better view from where you're sitting. But guess where you're going to go? You're going to end up in the same place. And quite honestly, it's it's if you weren't convinced in 2016 that we needed to do this, um, I don't know, in 2020, after doing this a second time, uh, I, I get it that people are exhausted and they're frustrated. But um, now is the time. It's April. It's only April. You've got a good six months of organizing and looking at who's on the ballot uh, and finding out what the platform is. And for me, it's the Green Party platform. If you look at it, it's kind of like the Bernie platform on steroids. Yeah, they're so, offering everything that Bernie was offering plus some, um, especially on foreign policy yeah. and environmental policies. Um, yeah, like they're they're actually trying to ban fracking. Like Bernie, I don't think some of his environmental policies weren't going to get rid of that all the way. And it is right. sad to see that Bernie and AOC and Ilan Omar, um, they were well, Justice Democrats. They were put there to transform the Democratic Party, but it seems like the Democratic Party is transforming them. Um, and the thing you were saying about Bernie and Russiagate, Jimmy Dore said that Bernie pretty much Russiagated himself there. Uh, it's We could go on and on about all the defaults that Bernie did uh, during yeah. this campaign. Uh, he definitely was not the independent revolutionary that he presented himself to be in 2016. He seemed to be more so a 20, like a, another Democrat. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it was, you know, you don't have to agree with everything Tucker Carlson says, but on yeah. one of his shows, he talked about, he said that Bernie Sanders was the lamest revolutionary he's ever seen. And he went into detail about how if you're a revolutionary, you're, you're talking in language that is starkly different. It's, it's just more vivid and you've got fire and you've got passion. You're not saying all the time, you know, my good friend Joe and all of these things. I mean, Joe Biden may be his friend and that's okay. And I'm not saying he can't be friends with Joe Biden, but to continuously bring it up in a way that, that makes his supporters think, well, wait a minute, this guy is supposed to be fighting for what we believe in and he, he's talking so nice. I mean, at the very end of it, if he loses and he wants to be gracious and say, you know, good luck, Joe Biden. Uh, I've known Joe Biden for, for a long time. He's a friend of mine, blah, 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 blah. It's the way Tulsi went out, too. It's the same thing. It's like, hey, if you're going to do this, why are you doing it before the end of the campaign? Why are you making this a thing where people start to suspect that you really don't have the fire in your belly uh, uh, to take on the establishment. Um, quite honestly, Bruno, um, you know, he's 78 years old. Uh, 
he's, he's been in politics for a very long time. And, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who I think believes in term limits. I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about that issue mm. recently. But I think you know, he's been in Washington, D.C. for an awfully long time. He's probably made some friends, uh, and it's not a bad thing to make, make friends, but those relationships, I think, um, they can obscure your mission, I think, if you're just too focused on try, trying to get along with people. I, I know Tulsi talked a lot about you know baking, making toffee and bringing it to other yeah. people so they'll listen to your point of view. But we need to see here. <clears throat> This is, I, I know this is probably going to be a little bit of a tangent, but the reason that people who like Donald Trump like Donald Trump is that he's a bomb thrower. He, every single day, he's yeah. throwing bombs out. And you and I may disagree with what he's, he's throwing out there, but the people who like him, like him because he's going to fight. He seems authentic and, to them, and so it's reassuring to them that he's actually going to yeah. fight for their issues. Right. So... Bernie playing Mr. Nice Guy here wasn't what his supporters wanted. And Tulsi Gabbard, who had a lot of fire during the campaign and was calling out Hillary Clinton, member of the Queen of Warmongers. Mm -hmm. I mean, she said some really cool, impressive stuff during yeah. uh, the campaign. But then at the end, just fizzled like, like a dud firecracker. And you're sitting there going, what just happened? <laughs> so... Um, Third parties at this point, you know, to give you an answer to your original question, I think it's the only mechanism we have left. I, I've been telling people um, you can't reform the, the Democratic Party. Some people, even Jimmy Dore the other night said, you might have better luck trying to get into the Republican Party, which is crazy. Yeah, because they're actually... Convince their constituents. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think he's wrong because... Trump is willing to do like a temporary Medicare for all. He's he's ready he's ready to start doling out a second or third stimulus. I don't think Biden or Pelosi would do, do this. Maybe they would under the pressure if they were in control of the government. Maybe they would, and maybe they're just being contrarian because they hate Trump. But see how that works. The country is screwed by this tribal nonsense. It's it's just I hate it. I hate it. I wish. If Trump decided tomorrow that he was going to do Medicare for all, the Democrats would oppose it. Because yeah, Trump's everything doing. Trump does is bad. <laughs> they have to oppose everything he does in their eyes. Right. Yeah. So I, I am for doing the authentic, real, you know, when I say third way, a lot of times people interpret that as like the independent and nonpartisan thing. I'm talking about going around the current two party system and, you know, whether it's you and I doing our own media or doing our own uh, news, per se, and telling other people about it, this is the way, uh, the future that people are going to hopefully get some of their information, rather than going to MSNBC or Fox News or whatever. So be it. That's We've got to start somewhere. Yep. So what can we do to unify other progressives? Specifically, the ones with the big voices and the platforms on indie media, like uh, MCSC Network and Convo Couch and Jimmy Dore, uh, Kim Iverson. How can we get everybody to agree to do something? Because I, I remember seeing you on Twitter getting into an argument with other people about thir choosing third party or writing in Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Uh... That's a really good question. If you go down that list of people, and I've, I've tried kind of, it, there have been times, I will admit, uh, on, on YouTube where I have called out certain commentators. I'm actually friends with uh, Craig Pasta yeah. over on Convo. He and I have kind of conversed a little bit back and forth. I was supposed to be on his show. And it just He's on the West Coast, and I'm on the East Coast, and it just didn't work out. Uh, um, it's, it's really tough because everybody has got such um, an independent streak. Um, Kim Iverson, which she does, I think she brings a lot of uh, people who are probably maybe even a little bit more conservative, uh, maybe in other philosophical ways they're a little bit more conservative than the average uh, progressive voter. 
but she breaks things down in a way that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I think she's a, a media star, kind of, and she had a background in uh, radio broadcasting, and obviously she's um, nice to look at. I'm just going to be blunt about it, so a lot of people tune in um, to see Kim, and she, she offers a really good perspective. She'd be a person to try to reach with this stuff because I think her audience is growing a lot. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Dore, <laughs> Jimmy Dore has a real hang up with um, Howie Hawkins, who is in the Green Party and who is the contender, like the front runner right now. And he eviscerated him on a show, uh, and it was it, it was really bad. And I don't know <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. Um, I don't know if it's a personal issue. Uh, he's talked Probably a lot the Russia Gate stuff. Yeah, uh, Jimmy talks a lot about the Peace and Freedom Party, which I looked that up, and it's kind of in California, but it's not, not really anywhere else. Yeah, uh, what I can tell, maybe it's growing. Um, Nico is great. Nico is a, is a really strong voice out there, and he's had Dario on his show, like I did yesterday. Uh, Nico would be a guy I think you might be able to convince, but the but how do you unify? First of all, you've got to you know things have to happen in a way where people finally make a political calculation at the end of it, and they say you know what there's there's no Democrat that I can vote for, which is true. There, there's no Republican that I'm going to vote for, although I do hear that there are a few Bernie people that might go back to Trump. Some of them had come over for Bernie, and it's a weird coalition there, but I think, again, it it's about the idea that Bernie doesn't fight for stuff, and even if Trump does like 5% of stuff that um, independents want and like, he's going to fight for it. So they're going to say, it's either the guy who's got onset dementia or Trump, and Trump's a train wreck when he gets up and has a speech, but I don't know. There are people that, like I said before, that believe that he is fighting for whatever it is that they think is important to them. But I think there's a huge opportunity for a third party right now because you've got 2016 all over again, except Hillary had most of her faculties, I think, whereas Biden does not. Although Hillary, there was a lot, a lot of questions about her, her overall health going into that mm-hmm. election if you remember, but yeah. Biden, here's the thing, if the Democrats, there's more and more rumors about how they're going to replace Biden prior to the convention or at the convention, that is a real possibility, and that's not a conspiracy theory or anything. They can choose whoever they want. This guy over the last, yeah, the couple of weeks that I've seen him try to do television, try to do interviews, um, he's a train wreck. He, he's He's mangling or he's jumbling sentences. I'm sure you've seen it. Yep. And that might be a game changer because if you do bring someone in who's, you know, articulate, say they bring in like a guy who can speak uh, clearly, say they bring like a like an Obama type character back mm-hmm. in who can speak, like Deval Patrick is sitting out there. All right. He ran briefly for president. I know this is a wild theory. Um, it would be like uh, Barack Obama part two if, if they were to say, hey, Duvall, you know, you're articulate and you're you're basically you come from the same stock as Obama. And it's like having Obama and Mitt Romney as one person. And some of the country might they might go for that. And it scares me because you're not going to get any of your agenda that the independents and progressives want. You're going to get that pretty much the same stuff we have now, but you're going to get a nice man who um, speaks and who's empathetic and so forth. And apparently there are a lot of Americans that um, that's what's most important to them. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to Israel S. Daily, a big talk, little talk the other day about how we also need to coalesce people who are apolitical or people who consider themselves moderate, who are blue no matter who, like these suburban people and even Republicans and conservatives, I think a lot of us, a lot of these people will agree that we need to get money out of politics. 
And so I think one thing that everyone, you, me, uh, everybody who has an indie media platform needs to do is remind everybody, what is the main goal here? The main goal is to get money out of politics. Um, so I think that's one thing that could be helpful is to just constantly remind people what the goal is. Money out of politics, money out of politics. Um, right. all, our, all these politicians, Republican or Democrat, they're not going to represent you because they're getting more money from these corporations. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's like, I, I was having this conversation, I mentioned this earlier um, with this libertarian guy over on Twitter who followed me yeah. probably because of mostly the Tulsi stuff and there were a lot of libertarians that wanted Tulsi. And he and I disagree on economic policy, but I, I, I listed off like six or seven things. Um, the surveillance state, um, Big Brother, basically taking your information. During this COVID thing, there's all kinds of stuff coming out almost by the hour about how the government is going to use this information against us, possibly. Uh, reforming the banks, that's another huge issue yeah. that crosses party lines, breaking up the banks, understanding what they're doing to the monetary system right now, uh, libertarians, conservatives even, uh, and Greens, all of those people agree on those sorts of things. So I think finding maybe a half dozen issues where, and that's what I did with Dario, I said, you know, there are a lot of issues that cross over that people don't realize, free speech. Um, very important to conservatives and to what I call real old school liberals who knew that you had to defend the most egregious of speech and not just put it in a category, hey, if I disagree with you, um, it's hate speech. And hate speech is very Orwellian to me. It sounds like now I have to shut up because you've deemed me a hater and a hate speech person yeah. um, when I'm just espousing a few say that for instance, in Syria, I don't believe the narrative, that the common narrative about how, um, you know, uh, Assad gassed his own people. I don't believe that. Well, you're a Russian agent, you're a conspiracy theorist, and right there I get shut down for having an opinion. So I think if you coalesce around, and you made a good point there, if you can sell some big ticket issues like corruption, like the way the banks work right now, um, student loan debt. My wife has um, close to $100,000 in student loan debt. And Dario Hunter, the guy I interviewed yesterday, mentioned that he had, I think he said, tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands. I'll have to go back and, and look at the interview. But um, there are thousands of Americans who um, got duped into you know going to college and then getting out, and then there's no job there waiting for them that's going to pay off their debt and, you know, allow them, uh, a, you know, a decent living. So, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot that can be done to coalesce. You talk about the suburbs and the, you know, the soccer moms and all these different uh, people out there. Uh, you have to convince Republicans that they've been voting against their own economic issues because they're holding on to their cultural issues yeah. so tightly. And... And, the, and by the way, the left has to do a much better job at, because, you know, I, I'm a Christian, I, I, I make no bones about it, I'm not a racist, I'm not a homophobe, I'm not any of these things, and yet, all day long, that's the, the caricature, and uh, um, you need to reach out to everybody, because you'd be surprised at... Um, you know, there are a lot of Christians that are compassionate and that want to help people. And, you know, that you'd be, again, you'd be surprised the kind of coalition you can build if you change the way your language goes out and how that's yeah. branded and so forth. So that's just my opinion about it. No, that's good because focusing too much on the SJW stuff, like the social issues, is repellent to a lot of people who consider themselves conservative. But if we focus yep. more on the economic issues, which is what Bernie Sanders initially did back in 2016, right. that's how you expand. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't seem to understand that, and they're too focused on this 
um, equality and fairness for everybody, which is, which I agree with, but it's not, it's going to scare some people away from your movement if you, that's, that's your main message. The main message should be, you know, anti-corruption. Right. Um, and I remember Kim Iverson talked about in the video that in order to have like a more formidable third party is to have it be like an anti-establishment party where we just unify like the libertarians and the Green Party people and all other people. Do you think that that's possible to do to unify libertarians and Green Party people and other people who consider themselves yeah. independent? Yeah. Um... It's going to be, see, the Libertarians and the Greens, they're, like I say, there are, there's a lot of intersection between the two parties, um, but there are, are some really um, big differences that uh, I don't know if that can be uh, reconciled. And, and where it really lies is in economic policy. And I used to be a straight up Libertarian. Few years ago, I just thought, hey, you know, the free market's going to figure this out. It's supply and demand. It's survival of the fittest. It's whoever has the best ideas wins. But I've seen this economy, and you know this for a fact, the, the difference between those at the top and those even in the middle, never mind at the bottom, is staggering, and it keeps growing and growing and growing. So I'm kind of in a place where I'd like to see an FDR-like uh, president come in and just say, look, we'll have the free market, don't worry, the free market's still going to be there, but I'm going to put tight controls on the banks, I'm going to put regulations in so you can't get scammed, if you go bankrupt, the credit card company's not going to come back in six months and try to give you another credit card, because that's stupid, that right. shows that they're predatory lenders. Um, the libertarians believe pr pretty much that the free market is going to solve all your problems and that private charity is going to take over, whereas the Green Party says, hey, you know what, government has to legislate some of this charity, so that's how you have to look at it, and that would be in the form of taxation, as soon as you say taxes, people run, I mean, in my own hometown here, you know, they wanted to put another fire station in, and I'm thinking, I, I live in a big town that needs a fire station, and, and everybody ran around with signs saying that your taxes are going to go up, and there's no way that we can do this. And I'm thinking, my response time is more than 20 minutes from where the fire station is. I think we need a, you know, a, a fire station, and I'm willing to pay extra taxes so I can have a fire station protect me and my, my, my family. So I think people need to understand that if you're going to coalesce, um, the economic component of this, and you mentioned Bernie Sanders, he was getting support because people agreed, hey, Medicare for all sounds like a good idea. Hey, a Green New Deal, where there are thousands of, of green jobs available to people, entry-level jobs where they can build green components or uh, get involved some other way in the green economy. Those are, I think what this boils down to, Bruno, is how you, how you sell it, how you pitch it. And understanding that pe certain people have free market ears and other people have been raised in an environment where they're taught that uh, countries like Sweden and Denmark, uh, places in just various places over in Europe have kind of the best of all things in all worlds, like they, they have a hybrid economy. And I think you can do both, but again, it's real hard. It's like What's that expression, herding cats, mm -hmm. where you get libertarians and greens? Um, the greens know that they've, they've got the libertarians beat on economic policy, but if you talk to libertarians, they're going to tell you that the greens are going to bankrupt the country because their proposals cost too much and there's no way to pay for it as the usual response. And see, Bernie had, had answers to those questions, like taxing Wall Street transactions. He had, he had really good answers, and I think... You have to, you can convince people. I'll never forget Bernie when he went to Fox News and did that town hall, and people said, "What's he doing going to Fox News? It's like hostile territory." He went in there, and it was one of the best moments of the campaign, where all these so-called conservatives were raising their hands for Medicare for all. Yeah, I'd rather ditch 
my own insurance because that's a big tax on me all year round. Pay some extra taxes, but compared to what I'd be paying for health insurance, this, this is a better deal. So I think it's how you explain it. It's doable, but man, it's like the struggle of the century. Where it's, it's You ask a really good question because I'm not sure how to bridge the gap there, but I do think that, again, you focus on the commonality. Yeah. What do these two parties have in common? You like those two circles, where do those circles intersect? And then really focus and hammer on those issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can all advocate for that. Um, like the ones with a, a big platform can advocate for that. But we need to communicate this to them. Um, so, speaking of people with big platforms, uh, you and I have been agreeing that Jimmy Dore is a voice of reason during these times. So, what would you say right now about Jimmy Dore? Uh, Jimmy is right now kind of channeling a lot of the frustration and anger. Plus, he, not only is he doing that, but he's like one... He always seems to me like he's one step ahead of where everybody else is. On like the other, like I told you about how he, he's starting to say things like Republicans are probably going to be more willing to listen to some of these things than Democrats, which is really screwed up. But he had a guest on the other day who said that out loud, and Jimmy agreed, and, and he threw his hands. I could tell when Jimmy's agreeing because he's he, he does this and he's he's all mm -hmm. yeah. smiling and stuff like Eureka you, you, yeah. you, know, you hit the jackpot with that. Um, I think he's a man that really cares about the working class and he, he realizes he's, he's kind of this is what I say to my wife he's kind of seen how they make the sausage and he's got like insight and he just he knows that this is crap and that we can do better but yet we keep putting out the same you know politicians I mean the Tulsi Gabbard interview, like I said, he and Steph were like, like heartbroken at the end of that because they supported Tulsi and they gave her a platform when NBC and all these other major outlets were just like, no, denied, blackout time, you can't be on the debate, sorry, even though you made the criteria, we're going to black you out. So Jimmy Dore, he, he is kind of like, you know, to use a biblical analogy, he's kind of like an Old Testament prophet crying hmm. out in the wilderness and yelling and screaming yeah. at the establishment and swearing. I mean, the guy, <laughs> I mean, there are times where my kids walking around and I'm like, all right, I've got to turn the volume down. But I'm, I'm internally, I'm loving him because he's channeling the, the frustration and the anger of so many uh, people who are no longer being, you know, the great forgotten man and woman that, that just not being represented. So he's, I mean, he's got 700,000 subscribers or so. I'd love to see him get over a million. Uh, and I think you need to keep retweeting his stuff, making sure that you're watching his stuff, um, especially now when everything is uh, in lockdown mode. I think uh, it's very important that uh, we support him and his efforts and tell people if you haven't. I know a lot of Trump people that watch him faithfully because. They just, again, it's that whole, he's fighting. He's fighting for us, you know, and yeah. you're not seeing that. You it just, seems see genuine to them. And yeah, so. and, it's, and so we're, we're all bland compared to Jimmy Dore. I can't compete with that. I just do the best I can, and, you know, occasionally I do an impression here and there, and people are laughing at me, but the, the thing about Jimmy Dore is he's, he's here for a reason at this time. You know, I believe in that. And again, he says I'm a I'm a jag off comedian. That's what he always says. And I'm uh, if I can say this, then anybody can say it. I went out and bought the the book that he read by Thomas Frank called Listen Liberal. Oh, uh, I got that and too. It, did you read it? Yeah, I read it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it talks basically about how the Democratic Party destroyed itself in the 1990s under Bill Clinton, and it became about the meritocracy. It's like all about, you know, are you one of these ivory tower people because then you're a competent person and the truck drivers and the, 
you know, the repairmen who we need and depend on, especially right now, um, these are the people that make the country work and keep the lights on and so forth. Uh, it, it shows how the Democratic Party just walked away from those people. And that's why, you know, the Green Party, again, not to keep harping on the Green Party, but the Libertarian Party will tell you that, you know, we're going to let you keep more of your income. The Green Party is going to tell you that we're going to try to work on these systemic problems that exist, like income inequality, um, the environment. You don't hear, the, see, the Libertarians are kind of like, yeah, free market will fix the, the environment because they'll invent something that eventually will fix the energy problem and we won't be emitting anything into the atmosphere. The Green Party says, hey, um, we got like 10 years to figure this out. Let's hurry up and get moving on it. And by the way, no more war because war exacerbates the problem because you have to have cooperation among nations. It's what Dario Hunter talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree. I agree with all these things. And you're talking to somebody who was far more conservative a few years ago on a lot of these issues. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I see Jimmy Dore is that his message resonates with everyone who's just sick and tired of this system. Um, yeah. And looking back at how he was on the Young Turks and how I mainly agreed with him and then followed him after that to his channel and found other people who were saying the same things that he was saying but in a calmer way. It's really reassuring yeah. to me about my, my gut feelings about things. Um, and also after reading more books and stuff, it's also reassuring and looking back at history. Uh, Jimmy's really, is, he's right about a lot of these things. Um, so, what else was I going to say? Well, there are a number of other uh, commentators you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So the, the other commentators. Yeah, so I mentioned the, I mentioned like uh, Kim Iverson and Nico House and um, the Combo Couch. These are people who generally agree with us more. But right. we need to also coalesce the ones that we're not really agreeing with, but are also considering themselves progressive, like the Young Turks and right. like uh, Humanist Report and those people. So, yeah. uh, what? How can we convince them about what we're trying to do here? Should we just yeah. keep reminding them? Look, our goal is to get money out of politics. Uh, you really got to stop right. focusing on these SJW stuff, but it seems like they're just so dogmatic with this stuff yeah. that they're not willing to listen. No. Um, when I first started doing my channel, I subscribed to the Humanist Report for a little while, and that didn't last long. Um, the T TYT stuff, unfortunately, I just, I never, I got in after, I think, Jimmy Dore had already left. Uh, and I, then I started, I watched some clips of Chank and Anna and so forth, and really kind of disturbing, especially because I was a Tulsi Gabbard fan, mm -hmm. and they were just not having Tulsi Gabbard at all. Um, you mentioned the dogmatic nature. See, all, all, see there, there are kind of different levels of independence, or I would consider both humanist and um, TYT more in line with the, the neoliberal order and establishment. I mean, I can almost guarantee you that both of those platforms at the end of the day, toward, you know, September, or October, they're going to start telling you, hey, Joe Biden, he's mm -hmm. our only hope. you got to go vote for Joe Biden. And I'm going to just, and Jimmy too, I'm sure he will just absolutely go crazy. Um, Chank has even said, he, he always says very mixed things like he, he has been critical of AOC as of late which is a good development but then when push comes to shove if it's Biden against Trump he's rather than try to go third party or just you know maybe I would say abstain if you really don't want to vote but he, he's going to tell you to go vote for Joe Biden and that to me is some of the if you're a progressive you're a so called progressive then you're enthusiastic about Joe Biden, I, I don't know how to, see, to answer your question. 
I don't know how you, I, I just don't know how you bridge that, that gap. You say dogmatic. I say there, there's a shred of this any blue will do thing going on because they just think if they got a D in front of their name, yeah. that's going to fix the problem. Uh, it's such an old way and of thinking. Because they don't, they don't like, here's the thing, they just don't, it's like the media. They, they just don't like Donald Trump, and I get it. Uh, I totally yeah. get it. I understand where they're coming from, but not. I said this in one of my first videos or, or tweets or whatever. I said, not liking Donald Trump is not a policy proposal. It's it's not a platform issue. It's a personality thing, and Trump, I think, doubles down because he knows that it's driving these people crazy, uh, and I don't think it's good for the country. But it, it, it's not going to solve the problem if your only goal is to just get rid of Trump. Because remember, Obama, all the things that they get on Trump for, like the immigration stuff, Obama was doing it. If you didn't like the deportations, Obama was doing it. If you didn't like a lot of those policies. And by the way, I am not for a real lax immigration system. I think we could do a lot better in welcoming immigrants here, but we still need to have a order. And I think most people that you talk to are going to also, in their gut, they're going to tell you that at the end of the day. I tell people, do you leave the door of your house wide open or do you have a lock on it? Do you have a doorbell? You know, there's certain things that make sense. And I think at times we go so far in a direction to try to just be against Trump that we lose perspective. Bernie Sanders in 2014 was not for immigration the way he was in this cycle. He believed it lowered wages, you had more unskilled workers, and you had people that, that were already here who were struggling to find jobs, and then you're going to import more cheap labor. And to me, you know, Cynthia McKinney, who used to be a congresswoman who's, who's very progressive, says the same thing. She's like, I don't, I don't get it. Why would we do this? So. I don't know, I went on a tangent there, but to answer your question about Humanist Report and TYT, yeah, and that's a tough sell, because TYT same is theater now especially. Funded, and Humanist is now yeah. in TYT, mm. right? Didn't he join, or is he affiliated with them? Yeah, he's more affiliated now with them. Um, also, people like Rational National, a Majority yeah, Report, yeah. and Michael Brooks, they're very, very dogmatic. Um, yeah, it's this Trump derangement well, syndrome, like you were you were mentioning without coining it. But right, I don't. We again, they're the ones. I, so so they're the ones with the loudest, with the biggest platform. Um, Tyt has over four million subscribers, so I think they could really make a change if, because people listened to them in twenty sixteen with Bernie, and. Yeah. Now we really need to convince them, but I don't know how, how that's going to happen, so that we can all unify around this decision on how we're going to overthrow the establishment. Right. Uh, I wish I had, you know, I wish I had good answers here. I mean, these are these are really good questions. I can say that. Um, you know, TYT obviously is a platform that gets funding and. Um, you know, it's not just self-funded like it used to be. So, you know, the the person who's doing the funding, um, they obviously probably have a an ideology, just like Rupert Murdoch does, just like all the big wigs at various uh, television networks have a philosophy, whether it's uh, Jeff Bezos or whoever, um, Comcast and so forth. Um, and, and it's sad because it's, again, the oligarchs, to use a common phrase that's word that's out there, the oligarchs end up, up having control over the people, and the people try to rise up, and they say, yes, you can talk about these things here, but if you start talking about these things over here, well, we're going to tell you not to do that and, you know, to focus on the things that we can kind of agree on. And keep in mind, Donald Trump is... A ratings boom for yeah. every one of these channels. TYT loves to destroy Trump every day. Trump will get up on the podium, hasn't even said anything yet, 
oh my gosh, look at the way he looks, look at his face. I mean, people are, yeah, there's a lot, There's his appearance is an easy target for, you know, on Donald Trump. But, again, at the end of the day, this misses the point. We're so, all here, the working class, the people that are struggling, the people who believe that climate change is a real threat to the, to the world, okay, and you're worrying about the way Trump words a tweet. You're spending your whole show talking about that he used the there as in the possessive there instead of there as in, you know, the other there. So it's, and this is the kind of stuff I see all the time. And I'm thinking to myself, man, how are we going to unify when this is just a cash cow for them? This is a guy who probably didn't even think he was going to win the election. Hillary was such a bad candidate, he ends up winning and then now he's implementing the stuff that he campaigned on for the most part. And I, do I like Donald Trump? There are things I do like about Trump. I do like the fact that he fights. Uh, he's relentless. He'll tear his opponents to shreds. Um, he doesn't mince words. And you need somebody who's independent and progressive who is like the answer to that. Jesse Ventura, who's out there, who I wish would jump in and run for president, he would be... Uh, he would be the answer to Donald Trump in that regard because nobody is going to be more bombastic and nobody is going to take any prisoners like uh, more prisoners than, than Jesse Ventura, former Navy SEAL and uh, wrestler, professional wrestler, and a guy who um, is, currently has his own show on RTA America and just mm -hmm. got back from Mexico. So I'm still waiting to see what Jesse will do because it's rumored that he might run. In the Green Party, um, he doesn't have a lot of time left if he wants to do that. But I don't know of any other person who's out there who can challenge Trump like that, kind of change the dynamic and not be this boring character where you have to just kind of be inspired by the message. People seem to want a personality. With they want a strong you know, figure, so. someone who they can trust. Yeah. Uh, what right. do you think about the rising? Do you think that they're a platform that's able to unify people? I mean, they have Sagar, who's more conservative, and Crystal Ball. Um, Sagar is like the new age conservative. Um, so I think yeah, I see their their stats going up. So I'm hoping yeah. people could jump the ship from TYT and go over to the rising, just to get their consciousness go up. Because um, the stuff that TYT yeah, that, does, like what you were mentioning, that's attacking Trump over the littlest things. That's only going to repel the conservatives away. Yeah. Well, Sagar and Crystal Ball are probably the best thing to happen in media uh, since Jimmy Dore, I'll say. Um, when I first started watching them, and Crystal Ball, I mean, I'm just this is just my own take on Crystal Ball. She can be, her, her, her presentation, her, her voice and so forth, at times, I mean, I, I'm I'm a child of the '80s, so I mean, she, to me, she kind of sounds like a Valley Girl from California when she talks. But with that said, I think it's disarming and friendly, and it's it certainly would get somebody listening who would watch Anna Kasparian, for instance, and go, "Oh, this woman gives me a headache," but then I can go watch Crystal, and Crystal will present it, and she's incredibly insightful and articulate and that she's representing the more independent progressive side populism is what they're both kind of espousing over there uh, Sagar is more on the right but he's, he's certainly in agreement with a lot of the things that you and I have been talking about he may be conservative on fiscal policy I've never really heard his whole presentation like his whole philosophy yeah. on things because it does he agrees with Crystal a lot, and he defends her, and they both are kind of hammering at what I call the pop. They, you know, Sagar comes from the populist right, and she comes from the populist left, and neither of them care about identity politics, which rocks. I love that. Uh, neither of them care about intersectionality, like how many boxes do you check? You know, they care about policy, and if you happen to be a Latino, a Latina, or a, you know, an African American, a gay African American guy, it doesn't matter. It's just, what do you believe in? It's like, what are, what are your beliefs and values? And 
I think that that's kind of like the new post-partisan, put this stuff aside, but unfortunately, all the people on TYT and the Humanist Report and the Biden campaign itself and the, the whole resistance movement, that stuff is bigger than I think you and I probably understand, and it's scary because those are the people that are going to go out and vote in droves. And this is why Joe Biden, by the way, is the nominee. And even though I know the voting machines are screwed up in California and all over the country, I don't think they're as screwed up as the amount of votes that Biden got versus Bernie. So as much as I want to say the whole thing was rigged at the voting booth, I think it, it's hard to make that claim based on the states that Bernie won in 2016 versus what he won in 2020. And I just think his, his campaign obviously didn't have the same level of enthusiasm. So getting back to your original premise, though, about these media outlets, I do think the rising... I really enjoy watching it. I typically watch two or three of their videos per day because I subscribe and they pop up in my YouTube uh, um, stream and so forth. And I'm always, I'm like, I go to YouTube to watch something else. I'm like, oh, I got to find out what they're talking about. And I will watch it because these guys, they don't, they're not antagonistic either. They're not like they have this personal hatred for Trump. Yeah, they try to be as objective as they can. Yeah, so I can watch that and not go, oh, these guys just hate Trump and they're just going to tear Trump a new one again today. And um, it's like the comedians on these late night shows. They just, all they do every night, this is what I mean about Trump. I mean, he's, he's kind of like a cash cow for all of these different platforms that basically make money because they sell the hate every night. Go, okay, you got to hate Trump. And the Trump people... Why do you think they're so loyal to Trump? You hate my guy. You hate my president. And I'm, it's making me more angry. And I'm definitely going to the polls. And man, am I going to pull that lever. And I'll do it twice if I can. That's the kind of enthusiasm we need, you know, as far as an independent, more progressive-minded person who will end these stupid wars that we've been in, who will really look at the climate, who won't be like, yeah, climate change is a hoax, you know. You need to have the opposite of that. You need to have somebody come back and say something like, well, have you have you been outside lately? Have you noticed the temperature's a little warmer? I mean, just somebody who can come back with sort of a friendly, but, you know, a little bit of a wise guy response, just so people will start to listen. Because, again, we need somebody who can counter that whole Trump thing. And it's, it's energy. And you may think it's negative energy, but it's still... Enough of it appeals to people in the country that feel that nobody is out there really representing their interests. So that's, it's unfortunate, but issues tend to take a back seat to this stuff. And it's pop culture. And, you know, one of the reasons Trump is president is because he was on television. Yeah. Uh, people knew who he was. He had 100% name ID. And you need somebody, hey, Somebody from the Hollywood left who's more progressive could come along. The problem is they're going to be neoliberal. And we're, we need somebody who's more Bernie and Tulsi and Dario and that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and who's also charismatic and who can, you know, really, uh, I guess, unite and coalesce movement. So anyway, long-winded. <laughs> Running out, of, running out of air here, Bruno. Yeah, that, was, that was really well said. And yeah, so um, any last things that you want to say before we close this off? Well, I appreciate what you're doing. I've got another friend, I don't know if you know him, Charles. He does a channel called The Vigilant Independent. I've been on his channel a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And he's a Carolina boy. He's an upstart. He's probably he's trying to get to where he gets monetized and I've been on a show a couple of times, and he and I agree on a lot of things. Um, all I could say is that we need, I mean, if you, if you people are out there watching this and you want to start a channel, I mean, I don't care about competition, obviously. I think more of us, the better. Yeah. We can, and, you know, we can basically start our own little, uh, call it a network. It's not a real network, but it's an actual um, network of, of folks who 
believe that the system is kind of broken and when you're pushed up against the wall rather than quit, you find a way around the car wreck. Because we watched the DNC car wreck twice now. If you're a Bernie fan, you're a Tulsi fan this time around. But especially if you're a Bernie Sanders fan, I, I put a tweet out yesterday. I said, I, I don't understand why Bernie fans aren't joining the Green Party in droves. Just out of principle. You don't even, you know, say you don't know much about it, but you look at their platform and you go, this is the stuff I believe in. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't have COVID-19, so you don't have to worry about that. Just talking too much. Um, so I think in the long run, what we all have to do is do our own little part, whether it's talking to our family, um, putting videos out, being on Twitter, trying to be civil with people. I, I struggle with this on Twitter, admittedly. I have a problem. It's, it's hard on Twitter. Kind of it's easy to get mad. Yeah, and I've, I've, I mean, I'll be honest with you, some of these former Tulsi people, <laughs> I'm just throwing it in here at the end, uh, some of the most difficult people I've ever dealt with. And you, you throw common sense and you say, well, she's not running anymore. Well, I'm going to write her in. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's not going to help because she's not running. She, her name won't be on the ballot, and I guarantee you that we have enough trouble in this country counting ballots as it is, and you're going to do a write-in vote for Tulsi Gabbard. I said, if you got a Green Party candidate or Libertarian or another independent that shows up and you believe in what they're espousing, um, put your energy into that. I, you can be faithful to a fault. I mean, these people that are going to continue to go out for Bernie Sanders in the middle of a pandemic, like, why? Why, why are you going to do that? He just dropped out. He's not going to win. Um, he has no chance. He, he said he's going to support Joe Biden for president. Um, I think that should be a wake-up call, and again, I'm in this, I'm doing the Green Party thing because I think it's, it's a logical move. I agree with about 80 to 90 percent of the platform. I think the party is perceived kind of fringy right now, and it's got to work, work on its image that it really talks about, you talk about corruption, for instance, they need to talk about that, the living wages, um, green jobs. Um, the Medicare for all, these certain, like I said, maybe a half dozen issues that are going to appeal to a wide variety of Americans and frame it in language that doesn't scare people. I mean, if you're saying, hey, I'm for an eco-socialist New Deal, that scares some people because they go, socialist? Whoa, 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 what do you mean? And me and Dario had a, a brief little conversation about the S word, as I like to say. Um, there are a lot of Americans that are scared by that word, and you have to explain what that means. It does not mean that the government is coming to your house to take your children or to um, block you from everyday freedoms that you currently have. But there are a lot of people that, like Trump, he's bombastic. He'll say, Bernie Sanders is a communist. And, and um, Mike Bloomberg did that at the debate as well, called him a communist. And so these are things that scare Middle America, they scare. This scares the, the people in the suburbs, as you say, who, hey, they just want normalcy. They don't want crazy. And if you start talking crazy, they're going to say, I'll just vote for Trump, or I'll stay home, or I'll even vote for Biden, because Biden's going to bring back the normalcy that we had when Obama was president, even though he had eight years of stagnation under Barack Obama that people conveniently forgot about. So that's how I'm. <laughs> That's how I'm wrapping up, uh, Bruno. I appreciate the time today. Yeah, yeah. So just so um, you can know more about us, I'm trying to do my part by reaching out to people who are apolitical. Because my um, colleagues from this uh, channel here, they talk about pop culture and sports. So we're hoping that yeah. they can get attracted to the things that they say about sports because they're great sports analysts. Um, and they yeah. also are very in touch with what's happening in pop culture and they report on that like uh, so we're hoping to grow that way and attract those people so they can get an objective perspective of what's happening in politics through me um, and grow our movement like that so I really appreciate you coming on Dave uh, thank you so much people please follow the Radical Independent subscribe to them uh, you can find them on Twitter on what's your Twitter name 
Uh, it's just my my uh, regular name, which is David Spuria. It's at David Spuria, and it'll say obviously my handle is the Radical Independent at David Spuria. So um, that's where I am. Uh, and, and again, the YouTube channel. I'm also over on Rockfin as well, which is a nice. cool little platform over there. Yeah, we're trying to go over um, there too. Yeah, it's um, the cryptocurrency thing right now is a little. It's a little sluggish. Uh, um, you're you're basically working pro bono for very little amounts, but the you know the, the hope is that someday when once this all turns around, that that crypto is gonna go up in value and uh, the videos are gonna be worth a lot more when you do them over there. But you get free speech over there. You're not gonna get censored. You're not gonna, gonna get any of your stuff pulled down. You can swear. You can be derogatory. Not that I try. I try to be kind of family friendly. Um, it's because I have a six-year-old and a 15-year-old in my house, so I, I tend to be a little uh, less. Uh, I do swear, but mostly in the car. So, <laughs> but in any event, um, yeah, sounds like you're going to do like a Joe Rogan type of, type of thing, which I think would be awesome. The more, see, Joe Rogan is respected because he's kind of apolitical, and people go, "Wow, Joe Rogan." You know, the other day, he was just really bummed out. He's like, they're going to make us vote for Biden. He's another guy who's got a great platform and uh, appeals to these non-political types. So good luck with that. Hope it works out. Thank you. And again, thank you again for coming on. Um, right. And we'll end the video there. Thanks for watching that segment of Hear Me Out. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit that notification bell down below so you can get the latest on sports, pop culture, and progressive politics. Stay informed.